Okay, hello everyone. Today we've got an interview with Grant Campbell, who is also known as Raw Aussie Athlete and is an ultra marathon runner. He is a tenor, a raw, raw vegan, speaker, teacher, educator, uh, among many other things. Interesting uh, life, interesting history, lifestyle, and everything. And it's someone I've learned a lot from. In, in the years, going to events and speaking to Grant. So, Grant, how, how are you and uh, where are you right now in the world? You seem to be in quite a busy a busy place. Well, I'm, I'm currently here at the Baosheng Organic Durian Farm in Penang, Malaysia. And there are a lot of people around, so I'm trying to, trying to help to get them quiet for this interview. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this little piano playing in the background. It's, 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 it's a really beautiful part of the world. Um, the, the durian quality here is amazing and the, the people, the family that runs this farm are just so beautiful, uh, such such beautiful spirits and, and you know they're open to being organic and they're looking at permaculture and they're, they're, they're looking at uh, composting all the, you know, the durian shells and, and all this sort of stuff. So it's some really exciting changes happening here. They've been organic for 26 years. Um, the, the owner once chopped down 100 rambutan trees. Um, <laughs> To, to let more, after he went organic, he was having a lot of worms. All the worms were coming from the neighbor garden, neighbors during gardens who were still spraying. And so that was, a, that was a big problem. And then he just made a bold move. He just cut down 100 of his, all, all, like 100 of his rambutan trees, except for one, and to let more sunlight in. And, that, and then all the trees got healthier and, and the worms weren't a problem anymore. And you know, trees had more leaves and started producing more fruit. And so he got back all the money that he lost from cutting the rambutan trees down. He got back all that money from from the extra durian that he grew, and yeah, it's a very happy story. <laughs> well, what is it about durian that everyone likes, and what was your first experience with eating durian? Ooh, um, durian, durian, durian turns on uh, people's silliness. <laughs> I think it, 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 it uh, I don't know, it, it, people just feel really relaxed. I guess in you know you can relate it to people. Um, um, you know, sitting, having a coffee in the morning at a coffee cafe and, and relaxing or, or going out in the evenings and letting their hair down and dancing and, and drinking and, and things like that. Um, and I think durian is a much, much healthier, and more constructive way of, of, um, of, uh, of just relaxing and enjoying life. And, and there's so many flavors. Durian has so much to offer. It's, once you start getting uh, durian that's freshly dropped, from the tree hasn't been cut and it's it's grown from you know with organic methods so so it doesn't give you a sore throat that you get from having sprays and pesticides and herbicides fungicides and all those things um, and you have some amazing varieties that just taste so so incredible I mean there's so many flavors you can I've had you know I've got a piece of uh, chocolate flavored Paulor here right now that <laughs> Paulor durian which I mean it, it has chocolate chocolatey butterscotch kind of flavor. It's really thick. It kind of has the, the sweetness and consistency of, of, of a cake mix or cake batter, as they would say in the US. Um, what's, the, what's the macronutrient ratio of durian? Because I know it's pretty, for, for a fruit, it's very uh, unique in terms of its composition, yeah. I suppose. It's, it's still, uh, the dominant calorie is still by far um, carbohydrates. The fat right. content is somewhere between 20, maybe as much as 30% of total calories, um, but it does vary. It can be even be lower than 20% in, in certain varieties. But um, yeah, I mean, there are so many different different types of durian, and, and uh, the, the, one of the best websites I've seen is, is yearofthedurian.com. If you want to learn more about different species of durian around the world, Lindsay Gashik is it Lindsay, Lindsay Gashik? Gashik? Yeah, yeah. Lindsay Gashik. She's put a lot of her uh, energy into into getting behind all science, and she goes to durian symposiums and. Just, she's been everywhere that durian grows around the world and, and <laughs> has experienced, and, and she loves it. She just, she's so passionate about everything about durian. And it's, it's a beautiful thing that she's bringing all that information in the form of various books, travel books about durian travelers and, and things like that. Uh, you, can all, you can see all that on our website. Yeah, that's yearofthedurian.com for people that haven't, haven't seen that. That's great. Um, and she is involved with this Baosheng Durian Festival in, in some yes, way? I don't... Mm. 
Yes, we just had the um, the Baosheng Durian Festival at, on this property where I am now. Just uh, for the last week of of June, uh, which which coincides with Lindsay's birthday every year. So you know, the festival will always will always coincide with Lindsay's birthday on the first of June, and uh, it's it's just an amazing party celebration of life. There's there's fitness um, activities there. Yoga and meditation. There's um, informational talks by experts in various um, aspects of, of durian. We even had a really interesting discussion this year about uh, the um, relationship between man and durian, or between human and durian, and mm. we, it really went in some interesting, really fascinating directions. And, and many of us thought about how profoundly durian has actually affected our lives because we've chosen to travel in certain locations because of durian. Um, it, it's, it's really, it's really interesting. <laughs> right. In your experience, have you, have you tasted any other fruits that can compare to durian or could, do, do you think could have that same effect of making people, you know, as you're saying, people travel for durian? Yeah. And have you had anything yet that compares or, I think, I think, um, I think in general, fruit from, I mean, nothing is quite the same as what durian does. Uh, durian definitely triggers some brain brain chemistry. Um, there's sort of feel good hormones, but um, yeah, but there there are certainly other fruits that um, that are just absolutely phenomenal. And when I have them, I'm not I'm I'm never I'm not I'm not wishing I had durian. Um, yeah. And, and generally, that the the kind of the guideline would be that older trees develop better flavors, and that's true for durian. It's true for fig trees. I've had some incredible figs from a hundred year old fig tree. They're just yeah. remarkable. They're flavor like you couldn't imagine anything better in your mouth. So, um, and the and the greatest persimmons I've ever had. I never, I, I couldn't, you know, nothing tastes better than than when that flavor was in my mouth. And same with the best custard apples and and chompadak is is a really amazing fruit. And, uh, I understand right now one of my friends is about to bring me uh, <laughs> what he claims is the best chompadak ever, the king of chompadak. <laughs> we have, I mean, there's more than 20 varieties I understand of chompadak, uh, and we've had quite a few of them here at, just at the on the Baosheng property in Penang, uh, from orange colours to oh, here oh, he just brought me some more durian. Thank you, Jonas. And so this, this is. Let's let's get this chompadak in, in shot here. It's real. <laughs> so it looks very very similar to jackfruit on the skin, but it's much narrower, and yeah. longer elongated, and and the arils of flesh don't aren't connected to the skin. So when you just cut the skin, you can just peel it off the outside, and then you can just hold the stem. Um, if you could just cut it straight down one one, that's all. That that'd be fantastic. I'm gonna pull the. So let's get back to your story and you. What 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 were you looking for? What were you searching for in your life that made you go towards health, raw food? You know, what what was the what was the process there for you? Mm. Yeah. Well, um, the process basically was. You know, as a, as a child, I had asthma pretty seriously, like uh, to the point where I wondered where I'd, where my next breath was coming from. Um, it was kind of there were some there were many desperate situations where I was kind of ready to go to the hospital. And uh, you know, I remember sitting up many nights as a child with my basically with my face on a on a fly screen, uh, you know, trying to breathe fresh air from outside my room. And you know, I was triggered by it. I had lots of allergies. From, I was had lots of cat and dog fur allergies and dust and pollen issues and I would get eczema. Even just showering, my skin would go all red, you know, like a kind of like a heat rash kind of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, it just, so I had all these, these health issues. I always, I always thought I was healthy, but in hindsight, you know, I wasn't so healthy. I had a lot of problems. And when I... The, as a child, my, my mother had conver converted us from having full strength cow's milk to having a lighter strength milk and then and then a really watery milk. And from that, I understood what it, 
what it was like to substitute something for something else and how the, once you'd adapted to that, that thing that, that suddenly tasted like water, but a week later it would taste like the, like the original food yep. again because you adjust your, your expectation of what that food is and your, your mindset. And so this watery stuff now was milk to me. Yeah. Um, so I understood the process of substitution from that, um, of substituting a healthier food for, for a less healthy food. And when I was 25, uh, I used to go rock climbing and canyoning in, in the mountains in Australia, with, uh, in the Blue Mountains, with, with a friend. And he told me about some information that he read that made him go vegetarian and then vegan. And that was just talking about how factory farmed animals were you know, not treated well and, and, and just the idea that cancerous meat ends up on supermarket shelves. And, and the other thing he said was about how when the animals are killed, you know, they're dying, they, they know what's happening, there's fear, there's, and, and all those hormones that are released, all that chemistry is in their blood when they're, when they're killed. And the idea of eating that affecting your behavior. And I, and I really did experience that when I went raw vegan that, that, that I felt different and I was thinking less judgmentally and, and much, just, uh, much more, uh, much more, um, connected with, with myself, with my nature and with, with the greater nature, uh, nature around us and connected more with other people and started valuing things that are more meaningful in life than, than power, status, possessions and, and stuff like that. So I just had that one conversation with that friend and there was a couple of things about that was pro vegan and he wasn't trying to change me, but it, it really um, flicked a light switch on for me. And from that day forward, like overnight, I went vegetarian and then, and then it took me 18 months um, before I went vegan, but it was done as a gradual process. So I didn't really choose to go vegan. I just became vegan because I'd eliminated everything that was from animals as I learned yeah. gelatin was an animal product and, and, and so on down the line. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of like after that conversation with him, I realized that I had just been floating along and just doing what everyone else had done and eaten what I was given. I never looked, never looked at ingredients, never cared about what I was putting. Just I was just filling my my gut with whatever gave me satisfaction in the moment, rather than um, valuing how I like valuing how I also felt afterwards, um, being just as important. Um, yeah, and so I don't know. I just um, I just started reading food labels all the time, and and I. I came up with some some guidelines that I formed for myself where I just didn't eat I didn't eat frozen food and I didn't eat canned food and I didn't eat anything with numbers in it like all the preservatives and all those things and I also didn't eat anything that had ingredients in it that I if I, if I didn't know what it was so that pretty much eliminated all junk refined food and um, you know I hadn't heard about 80 10 10 or anything like that at, at that time and the book hadn't even been released but um, yeah, but so I was cooked vegan for six and a half years uh, after 18 months of vegetarianism, and then then I came across the Perfect Health program by Dr. Douglas Graham, and and then overnight went raw vegan, low fat how, how, vegan. How did you come across uh, Doug Graham's work? Yeah, uh, a friend who who uh, was a Seventh Day Adventist um, that I worked with as a volunteer lifeguard in Australia. Um, she heard me talking about veganism one day to somebody that was asking me questions while I was on patrol at the beach and um, her ears pricked up because she'd, she'd always been vegetarian her whole life as a, as a Seventh-day Adventist and, um, and she had always aspired to be vegan but didn't know anyone doing it and didn't really know how to do it and so it had always just been on the back of her mind and suddenly she heard, oh, oh Grant's vegan, oh, wow. And then she just, she just went vegan like pretty much overnight. Um, from that, we had like a one hour, one or two hour conversation on, on patrol or watching the beach, and um, and yeah, she just she just changed immediately. It's and, funny uh, that that's, that can be enough for some people just meeting a person that's, that's yeah, also doing it. Yeah, and then so we would we would um, get together and have um, like maybe once a month have a just to get together with a few friends, and we would have there would always be a vegan theme, but we'd have maybe an Italian vegan theme and then a Indian vegan theme. Uh, and then, then we started having a raw vegan theme, just as a, like a you know as a one-off thing. And then she 
she found she found out about the Perfect Health program when it got released in 2005, and she loaned it to me in early November 2005, and and I listened to it like over and over again. <laughs> like it just it just resonated so well with me, and I, I just couldn't believe so much of it was com came, like felt like common sense, but I you know, it's kind of felt silly. I hadn't thought of it all myself. Uh, mm. To, you know, to eat health foods, and, and, and everyone knows he fruits and vegetables are health foods, but no one thinks of leaving out everything else. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just changed overnight, and, and I was, and going forward from there, there were, there were many times where I went back and ate, um, ate cooked vegan food again, and uh, because of emotional reasons. Um, you know, I, I would eat, like, 80, 10, 10 straight up for maybe two years and, and be totally, you know, totally solid in it. And then all of a sudden I'd have some, uh, like, uh, relationship kind of issues that I, that were kind of new to me. And it was an area, that was an area kind of, I hadn't really, like I'd grown in, um, like I became really open and, 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 um, valuing like initiative, and, um, in connecting with people and talking about things. And feeling your emotions and all that sort of stuff, and applied it to every part of my life and career and, and whatever. But um, but still, relationships remained a sore point for me. So um, they they that that caught me off guard on a number of times where I find myself just in a in a in a bucket of fried vegan food from a takeaway store or something like that. And uh, you know, and I and I could eat a lot, so it was really dangerous. It was really super detrimental to my health and, and a big act of um, lack of self-love, self-sabotage. Um, not consciously, but, but, you know, that's what it was. Mm. Yeah, and then, and then once I would have it, I would find myself back in this cycle of, a, of this a kind of addictive behavior that I never had before um, from food. Like, food, yeah. Like, but I, so I started using food as, as, as a way to medicate. Um, in, in these occasions and I'll just sort of feel lost for a short period of time. But then I'll snap back to, to eating 100% raw again. So I was always 100% raw vegan. And when I was off, I was like, you know, every night at least, um, it would be some sort of horrible cooked vegan food. Never, never home prepared. It was always like just some impulsive fast food kind of thing, last minute. You know, when you, you know, late in the day, people often find it difficult to train when they're transitioning to raw. Because yeah. they're they they're like lower in nerve energy, um, they've had a hard day in the office and they're, you know, feeling all this stress and they just want to unwind and, and let their hair down and not not be strict or disciplined and all these things. Um, so they you know they struggle at that time, but you know that's the times where where you know you have the opportunity to be greatest growth when you're feeling most vulnerable. And I know that now, but but uh, I didn't really I didn't really know it then, and I was still feeling my way through it. So there's something I love about the ultra marathons that I do is it leaves me in a really vulnerable position and you know, I can choose to stop at any time, but I'm going to let myself down. I'm going to let my support crew down. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's just interesting to, to know that there's always something within you that, that can drive you to keep going almost for no reason. It's like you just have that internal resilience, no matter how unfavorable things are around you. You have this inner strength and resolve yeah. to to just continue to go, um, regardless of any lack of support that may be may be perceived, um, and you know just just drawing on something within yourself, or maybe even something greater than yourself. I'm not really yeah. sure. That's 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 great. A great summary of that. And <clears throat> you. You've, you've been an athlete all this time, and obviously you were saying you were the you sw swimming and working on the beach there. And um, what pulled you towards running ultra marathon and ultra marathon running ultimately? And what's what draws you towards running, and what's your joy in that? <laughs> I think uh, some people ask me what what am I running from. That's always an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> I don't think I'm running from anything. I'm, uh, I run for many reasons. Uh, I run. I found that running helps me to know myself better through 
through putting myself in those vulnerable positions out in the middle of nowhere when I'm tired and fatigued and, you know, like you can make it some, sometimes you're making life test situations like how much food do I need to take? How much water do I need to take? And it might be really hot. And if you don't have enough water, it could be really dangerous. Um, so, you know, it's, um, and just being able to, um, I love exploring, like exploring that, just have that in, in it, that instinct to explore, to just go out into trails and, and see where does this go? Where does this trail go? I love doing that. Um, so I often do, do races where I haven't, I don't know where the trail even goes. And then I just turn up for the race and, and get the map and then figure it out as I go. And, and that's really exciting and adventurous. Um, I love being able to run further than most people care to drive. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Um, being able, just knowing that I can go from this mountain to that mountain far away, and 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 I, and I don't need much, you know. I just need, you know, maybe a, a liter or two of water and 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 a, and a certain number of calories from from fruits, and and I'm good to go. Yeah, and you're, you're going to be doing a race uh, here in the UK when you come over in about less than a month's time. You're going to be coming to UK, and you're doing the course. Yeah. Coast to Coast Ultra in England, and that starts that's from Whitehaven on the west coast. If anyone's interested, if anyone out there would like to yeah, come along, help out, participate in any way, if anyone's watching this, it's going from Whitehaven to Newcastle, so it's going along that Coast to Coast Ultra. Um, so, what, what, what's the uh, what's your plans with that? Are you gonna uh, are you going to try and win that race? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is there's, a, there's currently only 10 people entered in this race. Um, so <laughs> I guess I have a good chance that way. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I, I really don't know right. what talent the other guys have. So I'm really, I'm really they, they allow you 38 hours. It's, it's 140 miles or 225 kilometers. It's not flat. It's, it's very... Um, I mean, I guess you would know better than me, Ronnie. Um, it's, but it's quite. I mean, I've yeah. heard. I've heard it's quite up and down. No, it's it, not. Although that you don't go to any yeah. great altitude, but it's there's a lot of hills there. Yes, yeah, it's a lot of altitude change when you add it all up. And uh, the race director describes it as extremely difficult, and they they insist on a pretty pretty decent hundred miler or longer qualifier, a decent time, so they, they won't, won't accept just anybody. Um, I, you know, I just, they give you a 38 hour cutoff time. If I finish between 32 and 36 hours, I'll be, I'll be really happy with that result. Um, I'm just got to see, take it as it comes and, and just, yeah, I'm just going to try to go out there and run consistently. Uh, in the past I've, I've gone out too hard early in races and, and haven't and felt really great, but yeah. then it, obviously it's not sustainable if you're going faster than what you're able to can keep you, up for, for you 38 hours. For People, what is your what so, is your diet? What is your kind of your routine with your diet? And does that change when you have to race? Do you have to change anything significantly about that? When I when I race, um, it, it becomes more important to to balance everything correctly. Uh, you know, I can't make any any poor food combinations. I really just want to eat one fruit at a time. Um, I have to make sure I get enough calories. I have to make sure I get stay hydrated if, because I, I'll, I just won't be able to perform. I can't have too much fat because um, it'll affect my oxygen delivery and make my blood all thick and sticky. So I won't be able to deliver other nutrients effectively or get waste products out of my cells effectively. Um, so really, like, so I'll be sticking to a uh, really low fat, like no overt fats at all for like five days before the race. Um, just that, that seems to work really well. I've done that in the past and it seems to work perfectly. Um, I eat 80, 10, 10 raw vegan, so I keep my average fat and protein intakes below 10% of my total calories in my diet. Um, I don't calorie count, but I just know from experience, you know, what, when I have more fat than that, I don't, I don't feel great. So, um, I, I value eating vegetables and leafy greens as well. Uh, I eat 100% raw vegan, so I don't eat any cooked food at all. Um, I rarely have any spices like, like um, 
it's just a few times a year I might have something with a little bit of chili yeah. in it that someone that, that you know just for whatever reason I don't know why um, I don't I don't I don't it doesn't affect me I don't have any like flare ups I don't feel any discomfort um, but I do think it's irritating to the body a little bit so um, but I still but I still have that that's probably one of the exceptions that I make from time to time but apart from that I'm just having yeah, like like all the tender leafy green vegetables, like lettuce, celery, and and then cucumbers are, are something I like to include regularly in my diet. At the moment, I've been in Asia for the last um, six months, so haven't had access to good tomatoes or um, zucchinis. But um, yeah, I haven't really had access to a lot of good leafy green vegetables. I've had some well, some good lettuces here, but not not with regularity. So I'm kind of feeling, I don't feel as good when I don't I'm have say that, um, some people leafy that greens every day. Either but. promote fruitarian diet, like a 100% fruit, or they say that when they're in the tropics, when they've got access to better quality fruit, they feel that they can, you know, do just as well on on just fruit as as kind of one of an 80-10-10 program. So what's your, been your experience and thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think I think there's definitely an imbalance when you just eat fruit. Um, I think some of the some of the people's arguments are that they're having higher quality fruit that that's grown in more mineral rich soil, so there are more minerals in the fruit than and and more nutrition in the fruit than than you would get, you know, in conventionally grown food or food grown in in poor soils in other countries where they're just kind of factory farming food. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I do feel, I do feel like the food in uh, in a lot of Asia is is more nutrient dense. It does it is more satisfying. Um, I feel like you're getting more for each bite. Um, but I don't feel like it's a sub. I don't think like I don't feel there's any substitute for having leafy green vegetables in your diet. Uh, you know, I don't think it's just about minerals. I think minerals you get more minerals from from vegetables than you get from fruit, for sure on average. And it seems that, we, and, and Doug Graham certainly promotes that we need those extra minerals that you get from vegetables, uh, particularly tender leafy greens, which are more delicious to us than, than a lot of the other vegetables. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's something about leafy greens that, that seems to be important to, to keep you balanced. And uh, people do really well for a year or two, or, or maybe even up to 10 years on a fruit only diet. They, they can they can do quite well, but but it seems seems that the people that do that are slowly building up some sort of deficiency because they tend to get they tend to either lose their mind or they start getting hair, skin, eye problems. You know, call them mineral deficiencies. I'm not really sure what it is, but long term, it doesn't. I haven't seen anyone just like doing fruit only. I know I know there's Anne Osborne and a few other people that that are just eating. So you know, I don't know. There's there's exceptions. There seems to be some exceptions to the rule, but in my experience, it it doesn't work well to mm -hmm. just have no. So to just eat fruit <clears> only. I'm gonna ask as well. We'll yeah. get back into that a bit more. But do you have any kind of? Uh, some people talk about the idea that they want to eat in line with like the circadian rhythms. Do you try and stay away from eating late at night, eating early in the morning? Do you have any kind of cut off time for your Diet, right? Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't have. Um, my life doesn't tend to have regular bedtime and regular rising time. Um, just day to day, the nature of day to day stuff just tends to get in the way of that, and I'm not like rigid and disciplined. Like, oh no, I have to go to bed because it's dark or. I do feel much better when I don't eat late at night. Um, I have better quality sleep for sure. Um, I, I like to finish eating a few hours before I go to bed. Uh, but you know, if but but I also will eat just before going to bed if I if I if I'm you know feel the need to uh, if I just kind of there's food there and it's going to go to waste or I'm you know feeling hungry. I'm not like yeah. rigid about not eating before going to bed, but 
but as a principle and in general, um, yeah, eating about two hours, two to three hours before going to bed would be the latest I'd want to eat. Um, yeah, as far as like, if and I and I'll adjust. Like, if I might stay up till one a.m. to get uh, to finish off some project work on my computer, um, but then I'll try to sleep in till till ten o'clock in the morning. And and if I wake up and I'm still feeling and I, because I maybe ate too much food too late at night, if I wake up and I can still feel it in my stomach, um, you know, then I just I just won't eat. I'm, I'm happy to just not eat until even like 2 p.m. or something. It's just I'm not really I'm not really phased about food. Like I'm not I'm not driven by food. I, I, I really feel a lot more freedom as the years go by from food. So as long as I'm getting enough calories per day, um, you know, some days I'll eat more than others. Some days I train harder than others, and I just eat according to how I feel. After I run an ultra marathon, I might I might <laughs> when I run. Uh, I ran a 222-kilometer race from the east coast of Australia to the highest mountain in Australia. It's called Coast to Cozzy. And after that race, I, I was just shocked at how much I ate for the next like for the next three to five days. I would sit down and I'd just be ravenously hungry, and I, and I would eat like 20 bananas, just one sitting, just throw them down, and then uh, and then. Like two hours later, I'd have another 20 bananas and be re like ravenously hungry and just like eating with great delight from start to finish. No, you know, not force feeding myself or anything. And then a few more hours later, I'd have like another another 15, you know, say bananas. Like it was just, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. But at, at the end of the race, um, I'd lost like my my butt was just so much more trimmed than at the start of the race. Like I'd lost, you know, kilos of body fat <laughs> in that one race. Like like. I think a couple of kilos just from my from my butt <laughs> seemed to come from my butt, and uh, you know, so you 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 just get ravenously hungry and you eat to catch up. And so I feel like I can, like you know, rely on my body and my experience with eating um, to make sure I eat enough each day and make sure I'm staying hydrated enough. So most you know, a lot of days I don't drink any water, but here in the tropics it's really hot, and so I might drink some water. or I'll drink coconut water. Um, but yeah, it's I don't know. It's just over the years, it's, it's just nice to as you get more and more experience with it. It's it really is freeing, liberating to be able to actually yeah, listen yeah. to your body, and it and it doesn't say eat chocolate <laughs> unless of course it's chocolate uh, chocolate durian. Eat all okay, of, eat moving all on durian. something else that you've been obviously involved with food and sport a lot. Years of the last few years, you're, you're part of that team. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> Jump in that. You've been involved with yep various festivals and events around the world, and nice. Um, Woodstock looks like it's coming to an end. Yes. Uh, um, some other festivals have come to an end. I think yep. like that. There's, there's been a lot of drama or supposed drama mm -hmm. and things like that. But especially involved with that festival and things, and what's what's been your take on it as someone that's uh, kind of an insider, I guess, or been part of it, been part of all the discussions and things like that? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot I could say about that, <laughs> and uh, but um, you know. I've seen some 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 what you would consider disgusting behaviour from people, um, based on information that they haven't validated or verified. Um, there's it's so easy with social media to have mis miscommunications. Um, you know, people spend a lot of time alone in their own heads thinking about something, and they come up with with uh, you know these solid conclusions that, yeah. that that's the way it is, and they become really rigid in those beliefs. I don't know. I think I think that it kind of just highlights that with all this drama, like that, that just because you eat a raw vegan diet doesn't make you uh, doesn't give you emotional poise and emotional balance, and doesn't mean that you've worked on every other um, aspect of of being healthy. So um, you know, I feel like some people there 
you know, they just they have their buttons, and when their buttons get pushed, those old behaviors still come up. They may that maybe they've figured out how to eat raw vegan, but <laughs> but they still have some other issues. Here comes some more food. Mr. Brand came almost running to us. We found Mr. Okay, Sorry. I'm just doing something. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you have a second. They have no. I don't have a second. Okay. It's an interview. They're recording. Well, you want me to take a piece? Okay, I'm being forced to take an amazing red corn if it can run. Um, that is pretty special. So I, I feel like uh, whenever anybody has emotional trauma in their life that many people experience as a child and carry it through for the rest of their lives, unprocessed. You know, it just it just eats away at you, and it keeps. It's always going to be there until you until you accept, have acceptance, acknowledge that you're feeling something, and and allow those emotions, those feelings, to be processed. Um, even if you don't understand them fully, just to to, to uh, accept them and and stop trying to block those, you know, those um, that guidance that's coming from within your body that that something is is kind of amiss. Um, I don't know. I feel like like I'm, like I don't feel like we ever have emotions for the wrong reasons. If we're feeling something; it's the right thing to feel. We may be feeling something because you know, because um, because there's been a misunderstanding, but that but that feeling um, should should prompt you to to have a discussion with somebody about it in a in a compassionate way, in in an effective way. Without judgment, without aggression, without ego, and uh, it seems like yeah, just there's quite a lot of people in the raw movement that that aren't at that state where they're able to communicate in that way. So I mean, you know, there's fighting and squabbling and bickering. Um, some people get caught up in correctness uh, as opposed to being kind of having a healthy balance in life. It's like I'm right and you're wrong kind of thing, and that, that doesn't work either because that's kind of judgment, casting judgment. Um, letting go of expectations is is another important thing that I feel like a lot of people get get caught up on that can result in all these yeah and drama and, behaviors. Uh, some things I guess have never been cleared up fully, and there was um, a situation at one of the food and sport events that I, I think a lot of people have got the wrong impression of what actually happened. Um, I know you have been at a lot of those events. Did you have you ever seen anything? Untoward happening at food and sport events that you know that, that made you think it was worthy for the bad things Sorry, you just broke up a little bit there. Yeah, um, yeah, have I ever seen anything at food and sport events that were anyone treated badly or anything like that that you've seen or that you've experienced? You know what I see. Uh, the piano got really loud in here. Um, what I see is that um, I see people come to events and have a really amazing time and it changes their life and they're super happy and and just every now and then just one and a few um, go away and then something happens when they leave the event and their whole memory perception of the event changes. And it's, it's difficult to explain. I've seen, I don't know, like, like I've seen people that um, kind of are struggling in a certain aspect of their lives, and and then they they come out and they want to connect with people, and they and they go raw vegan, and it's all this health focus, and but then they then they just disappear from the world and shut down their Facebook account and shut down their all their connections with everybody and go and live in a forest or something, and 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 then, and they just kind of fall off the wagon, and, and there, there's maybe shame and all these sort of feelings, and they kind of go solo and go inward, and don't look for any support, and shut out everyone that loves them, and then they come back again. Um, I, I just feel like a lot of people have um, some deep issues that they haven't processed in their lives, whether it was um, some sort of you know maybe abuse as a child or whatever it might be. It can take many forms. Um, 
but again, I just I just feel like there's a lot of um, unresolved emotional trauma in people can lead to kind of almost crazy um, changes in mindset, like um, like uh, like I, I, can, I can imagine like you know like um, in Nazi Germany, you know, before the war, that people were just having these regular jobs and they're like which is bakers and candlestick makers, right. and the next thing they're they're murdering people, yeah. and you know, but they find a way to justify that. Um, so you're, we have these coping mechanisms. We have amnesia. We have multiple personalities. We have all these, um, they call them disorders, but that's just a label. Um, but, but they're coping mechanisms for when times are tough and 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 people experience trauma, and and you've got to cope with it somehow. And um, so. People aren't always rational. Um, I don't know. So I, I think that explains some some of the stories through the food and sport history that people um, say through time. But you know, I, I'm just generalising here. I'm not talking about any specific people. Um, have I ever seen Doug be negligent at an event? No, I haven't seen Doug be negligent at an event. Um, I, I, I find him to be a really caring person. Um, I, I found that sometimes, you know, he's he's um, he's made some videos that have come across like like um, like he's not being sincere about something. But I've spent enough time with him to know that's not the case, and I, I don't really know why. Sometimes when he's on camera, it's different to when he's talking to people, because he never talks to people like that. He doesn't. And when he presents on stage, he doesn't speak like that, and he's not like that at all in person. Um, and he, he doesn't, you know, he, I don't think he re recognizes that sometimes he comes across that way. Um, so I can see what people what people see when they when they see some of his videos and just go, well, that's not sincere, or that's this or that. But I'm, I'm watching the same video and I'm going, actually, no, he really that was that was him speaking from the heart, and that that it was being open and honest and, and clear, but. But they don't see it that way, and so they start looking for faults and flaws. Yeah. You can always look for the best or the worst in things as well. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just unbelievable all that how all the information just got dug up from all this, all from the internet, and then and they just put it together like a pile of evidence and say this is fact. Yeah, um, uh, most I mean, of it is fiction. I think it's all been quite sad. What's happened, and you know, I don't know what the future is really. Uh, with, with what will happen. Um, I think there's still a lot of people out there that want this information and need need to learn it, so we'll, we'll, I guess we'll see what's happening, what will happen, sorry. Um, to transition into another thing, you're coming to the UK as well because you're coming to the UK Fruit Festival uh, that's happening from the 5th to the 9th of August this year, 2015. You were, you were there last year, what was your yeah, I'm excited about that. Last year, and and why are you coming back this time? <laughs> no, you couldn't keep me away. <laughs> um, I, I think it's. Uh, I, I, I honestly think it was one of the most amazing festivals put on last year. I, I it really stood out as a highlight for me, um, for many reasons. Um, firstly. Ronnie, like just you, you know, you you have such authenticity, and you, you come from a completely um, selfless perspective, where you're just really putting this on, taking all this risk, and um, and it's all from the heart, and you really, you know, genuinely care about people finding health and and having and being able to experience the joy that you found and the, and the, the lifestyle benefits and growth and personal development that you found through through these events. So, um, and I really feel like you you delivered that flawlessly last year. Like it, it was, a I was just really shocked. You know, I, I don't expect a lot when a festival is put on for the first time. People people make mistakes, they overlook things, they you know, less, a lot of lessons are learned. But I didn't have any criticisms of the, of the UK Fruit Fest Festival last year at all. The the food was remarkable. The people that were there were just such beautiful spirits to be around. The activities were just awesome from start to finish, from the dancing, and, and obviously I enjoyed the running. Um, and 
yeah, there, there was just there were so many amazing talks from the heart and and something I really valued was uh, the, the fact that all the presenters were presenting it. You know, although we had slight differences, we presented um, a cohesive message. Like we, we were all on the same team. You know, I, like I, I was proud to be there as a member of that um, the group of speakers that were there and re and um, representing health to the to the community that was that was there to to try to learn and experience and and grow through um, in a supportive environment. Um, I just I just feel like that event delivered more than any art, you know overall Thanks, event that I went to last year. So, yeah, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> it's, what it's what are you going to be doing in this year, and what what are you going to be? I know I know that you're going to be sharing your story of your own transformation in your health, but what what else do you hope to be sharing with people this year at, at this year's event? Uh, well, I'll be going out and, uh, and leading some some daily runs, which, uh, which I always enjoy getting out. And you know, people will ask me about their running styles or whatever whatever we talk about. There's no there's no fixed um, agenda for those other than to just enjoy getting out of, around the property and running in nature. Um, yeah, I'll be telling telling my story from the heart, from the only way I know how. Uh, it'll kind of uh, talk about how my um, emotional path kind of un unfolded and how I, I grew and developed and came from a, a shy, you know, geeky, nerdy computer programmer um, to, uh, you know, and, and like lead guitarist in a metal band <laughs> to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to getting into healthy lifestyle and, and running ultra marathons and, and just, uh, and, but more than that, just really how I came to know myself, because I feel like I feel like we don't none of us ever actually change. I feel like we're born who we are, but but we get lost along the way and and we lose ourselves and and many of us like spend a whole lifetime trying to trying to get to know ourselves again. And I feel like I've through my life so far I've really gotten to know myself very well and and appreciate that that I know my values and I'm, and I. You know that I that I'm, I have the boldness to follow my heart and um, and see the value in communicating effectively in in, in situations that, that come up and yeah. yeah I just love that that I'm getting to live my life like being the best me that I can be because I'm I'm taking the opportunities that I see and, and creating new opportunities and that's a really exciting way to live so if, and I wanted to share that with, if with people. If people want to learn more about you, connect with you, what what can you, uh, do you have any uh, books or information or videos or anything you can offer people and where where would they find that? Yeah, well I have um, I have rawaussieathlete.com which links to um, a bunch of stuff uh, has all my race results and some, some articles and an article about when I did a, a 29 day water fast with, with Dr. Graham in Costa Rica, which was incredible uh, and, and life changing experience, which was amazing. Uh, and then I have a YouTube channel, Raw Aussie Athlete, that has running tips and emotional health tips. Uh, there's two playlists of those, a whole bunch of those, and uh, there's no, I'm going to keep releasing those as an ongoing series, and uh, I have some some videos about kind of you know fruits and vegetables and like kind of obscure fruits and vegetables things like that from my travels. Um, yeah, and, and I'm on Facebook and I'm on on all the usual social media places, and uh, and I work full time as director of education for Food and Sport, so. They have an amazing um, certified lifestyle coaching program where people can get certified and, and study up on all the, you know, all the all the best uh, all the all the eighty ten ten centric lifestyle information and and learn how to teach other people and how to become confident speakers and how to um, just really gain mastery over your lifestyle. Uh, a lot of people. Um, you know, struggle because they don't have enough knowledge and information, um, don't have, not getting the right experiences that, that would, 
make it um, sustainable for them to, to continue to live this way. Maybe they should overlook some really basic things that they only experience by being immersed in, in full, um, being fully immersed in, in that kind of living retreat sort of style that food and sport has many events are from, you know, from conquering diabetes event to health and fitness week to, to fasting events, to a walking tour, to, um, to um, culinary skills week. You know, you can learn how to make, how to use all these raw tools to just, and you know, from dehydrators and blenders and spiralizers and all these tools from a, from a, from a, a professionally trained chef, uh, Alicia Ojeda, um, along with Dr. Graham, you can you can learn how to how to make incredible foods to impress family and friends, or even to to open up your own restaurant. You know, like it's they teach you all the details about food, how to how to get enough produce, and how to how to manage quality of produce, and and what foods combine well and don't combine well. And, just all sorts of tricks and things that may take may take you ten or twenty years, or maybe you never find them out otherwise. So that's a, that's a really jam packed week there in, in Culinary Skills Week. I've, I've been to all these events, and they definitely helped me. Uh, were very significant in 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 succeeding in in yeah, choosing yeah, in truly desiring for a healthy lifestyle. Me. So. Favorite event. Yeah. Um, a personal favorite event. I think I love, I love health and fitness week. It's um, it's a, it's a crazy event because there's the days are so full. That, you know, you start the classes start at six a.m. And, and usually you're not getting to bed before nine p.m. If you go to bed early, like some people stay up later, and then and there's there's three two hour fitness classes every day. Um. And some of it's like um, slow, and, you know. There's always warm ups and and then intensity, and then a cool down. And every cl every warm up is different throughout the whole um, six day event. So you're getting eighteen different warm ups and eighteen different cool downs through the through the event. Uh, you're learning. Just, there's lectures on on uh, nutrition and and fitness each day. Um, which, which is, is just life-changing information. Um, I would recommend um, sure. you know, also reading Nutrition and Athletic Performance. It's a great book by Dr. Graham about for, for people um, fitness-related. And, uh, yeah, I, I just that, – that, that book really resonated well with me and, and Health and Fitness Week really resonated well with me because I, I learned so much from, from Health and Fitness Week over the years. I've been to it so many times, and it's always a, a – you know, happy family kind of feel, um, and everyone rises to whatever level they are, whether they can't jump over their own shadow when they come. Um, they're still welcome and encouraged, and, and they'll learn a lot from it. And to, to like, Olympic athletes that have also been to it and, and, and gotten a lot of benefit from it, uh, you know, I learned the value of strength training, yeah. like, like deadlifting. Who would have thought deadlifting helps you running? But it certainly does. It certainly does. Um helps me get through the mountains. It just helps me feel stronger. Uh, even though muscle weighs a bit more, there's a certain degree of muscle that, that's valuable for me to carry. Uh, it's not, it's not, right. I'm not a better runner as a, as a complete scrawny weakling. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I learned many, many principles and some of those principles I took, took a long time to, for me to learn. And uh, so I was very, very, I'm very, I feel very privileged to have been able to come to those events for, for so many years now. Since uh, since 2008, I haven't missed any health and fitness week events. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful for that. And um, yeah, it's, it's just helped really drum in a lot of principles over and over again. So I really, Excellent. really recommend yeah, so that event what, very strongly. What's next for you? And do you have any final comments just before we end the interview? What's next for me? Um, yeah, I'm just really, really looking forward to um, to hitting hitting this race, ac running across the country for the first time, all the way across Great Britain, and uh, yeah, and uh, and then and then three days later, uh, I got to be running, running, doing all these running classes with people <laughs> during the festival, 
and that's 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 going to be just really fun to to, to rise to that and uh, just and demonstrate rapid recovery and and uh, and just share have this whole just just connecting with so many people at the UK Fruit Festival. I'm, just, I'm really excited to uh, to do that. Um, and then after that, I'll be I'll be heading to the US for for two months yeah. of Dr. Graham's food and sport events. So good times, and then back to Australia in November, December. Uh, so that that's that'll be the first time I've been back in Australia since since early January. Yeah. So definitely a, a world traveler now. My home is my home is nice. where my heart is, okay, where my well, luggage is. <laughs> looking forward to seeing you in the UK. Yeah. Uh, for very simple needs. Grants running the coast to coast, coast to coast ultra. Marathon from Whitehaven in the west coast of England to Newcastle. I don't, I'm not sure exactly in Newcastle, but it's going ac across that route. If anyone can help out, wants to be there, wants to meet Grant at the end of the race, I don't know if there's that. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see if anything, if that's possible. We'll get in touch and we'll see if we can uh, work something out. Um, and Grant will be at the UK Fruit Festival from the 5th to the 9th of August. Uh, there's still places available if people want to come to that. And we hope to see you there. You can check out the website fruitfest.co.uk. And uh, just thanks for watching the video. Subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Leave a comment below. Uh, I can pass on any questions to Grant. And thanks for watching. Thank you.